It's always a really cool thing to be able to worship here, isn't it? It's, uh, we're, we're very privileged to have uh, the team up here. Who's been enjoying the uh, Jesus the Game Changer series? Yeah, I've found it uh, really good. A whole lot of world sort of leading minds coming together and um, giving their different perspective on the many different issues um, throughout history and um, that sort of explain why we are where we are today and um, the impact that Jesus has had. Now, one of the things I love um, as, I read, as I've read the Bible over the years is coming across the many different paradoxes um, that, that are in Scripture. Now, a paradox is a seemingly absurd or contradictory statement or proposition which, when investigated, may prove to be well-founded or true. And in many of the cases that we've looked throughout this um, Jesus the Game Changer series, the uh, game as such has been changed by Jesus throwing out this hard-hitting paradox, the seemingly absurd yet true. Now some of my favourites um, as, as you read through the Bible that uh, Jesus throws out there are these, whoever finds his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Seemingly absurd, yet actually true. If you want to gain, first give. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. If you want to be strong, first of all, you've got to become weak. And we've seen in the past few weeks um, how Jesus addressed equality where in a world where people's worth was and very much still is based on the family that they might come from, their occupation, their societal status, their wealth, their bank account, Jesus throws out the seemingly absurd and says, hey, no, all people are God's creation and worthy of love. Everybody stands equal before their maker. In forgiveness, where the rule was an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, Jesus slams that down and says, I'll tell you what, if your enemy slaps you across the face, don't slap them back, turn your other cheek. And he says, uh, um, yeah, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you. How absurd, yet it changes the world. He changed the way society viewed women and children in a very patriarchal dominated society, giving them honour and respect. And whilst his teachings about freedom continue to echo throughout the world in politics for the past two millennia, in, in the early centuries after Jesus' death, the gospel really did spread like wildfire as his followers actually lived out the teachings of, of Jesus by humbling themselves and looking after the poor, the outcasts, the downtrodden, the nothings in society. And the church grew and grew, and that growth actually um, brought about incredible persecution. But our forefathers, those Christians who first believed, um, yeah, started that found great foundation by living out the paradoxes that Jesus taught his people, and it changed the world around them till we come to today. Now, today's topic, we're looking at leadership. Now, Jesus um, was born at the time when the Roman Empire was at a, at a very powerful stage in its uh, life, at a time where might was right, where power was given honour above all, far greater than anything like humility. And it's in this environment that Jesus comes in and he says some very absurd yet true things. He says, he who is least among you all is the one who is greatest. And whoever wants to be first among you must be slaves. In another part, he says, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. 
I love it how Jesus continually just turns the societal norms on their head in a way that seems impossible, yet in hindsight makes so much sense. And we're going to learn a little bit more about how Jesus did that as we uh, continue with the video. Author and researcher Jim Collins wrote a very influential book called Good to Great. It looked at why some companies moved from being good companies to great companies. He discovered two things about the CEOs of those companies. Firstly, they had fierce resolve, but secondly, they were actually humble. Now, what Collins discovered in that area, we see in a number of different areas. In our politicians, we, we like confidence, but we don't like arrogance. We want them to actually give the impression they're serving the community. In our movie uh, characters, we want heroes that give themselves to other people, almost sacrificial. We can actually trace that shift where humility became a virtue, and we can trace it back to Jesus. would say things like um, the Gentiles lord it over others he was not being pejorative he was being descriptive uh, you know if followers of the Greco-Roman culture were to hear those words they would say yeah that's exactly what we do and it's a little bit like in our day somebody scores a touchdown is like of course I'm great so this notion of saying no actually greatness is servanthood greatness is to be a slave nobody in the ancient Greco-Roman world, nobody, Plato said, how can anyone be content if they're a slave? Nobody was talking about greatness in terms of servanthood and slavery and humbling themselves in the way that Jesus was. And over time, the attractiveness of that idea, the power of it took root. And so we kind of take it for granted. We live as if, of course, everybody's always thought to be humble would be a wonderful thing. That's not the case. That's an idea that came from somewhere. Paul, we're looking at the area of leadership and hero figures. What were the leaders of Jesus' time like? Well, they were very strong military figures. They had to be, because the point about um, the Roman Empire was that it had to establish um, Roman principles across a very, very hostile area. So they were strong, they were fierce, they were military leaders. And for me, one of the really interesting things is to um, contrast Jesus' understanding of peace with the Roman understanding of peace. The Romans were very proud of what they called Pax Romana, which is the peace of Rome. And effectively what they'd done is they'd established this period of great peace and tranquility, mostly, across the Roman Empire. And they did it by squashing any kind of opposition. They came in hard, they came in fast with their armies, and they just wiped out anyone who disagreed with them. The folks that were admired generally, they were courageous. There was a lot that we would look up to as well. Um, they, were, they were smart, they were industrious, they were effective. But humility was not looked on as a virtue in the ancient world. In fact, Aristotle would say that the great souled person would avoid, for example, gratitude. Because I don't want to feel like I'm indebted to anybody. I'd want you to feel like you're indebted to me. But if I was to express a sense of being indebted to you, that was seen as a diminishment of myself as a person. John, we want to talk about leadership and how, how people view leadership. But in the Greco-Roman world, how did people view leadership then? Well, there were different kinds of leaders and I think you can tell what a culture really values by the leaders that it elevates and honours. And surely there were philosophers uh, who were regarded as great leaders, you know, the, the Socrates, Plato, Aristotle and so on. And so these were revered for their intellectual prowess and were honoured as such. Uh, but certainly by the time of the first century, it was pretty much a military culture. And so in Greece and Rome, which had had centuries of you know, very little but fighting people and establishing their rule over different kinds of people, by that period, the greatest leaders were, of course, the military leaders. 
and th this blended with the kind of the early imperial period where the great um, emperors were military. I mean, you almost by definition had to be a military man to be emperor. So of course we all know about Julius Caesar, um, Augustus. And so this um, ability to conquer was at the heart of leadership for Greeks and Romans uh, in this very period. Um, wealth, I think, would be another marker of a great leader. And so if someone were e exceedingly wealthy, um, which probably meant their family was well connected with power, then they were also accorded honor and were, were regarded as, uh, as leaders and benefactors. So they were people that you could hang off and, um, and receive the crumbs from their table, as it were. Yeah. So philosophy, military, political power and wealth were what leadership fundamentally uh, was about. Let me ask, what about the kind of Greek gods? Did, did the way they see kind of religion, faith, deism, did that influence how they acted? Absolutely, and you've got to bear in mind this isn't just Greek gods, this is the vast majority of gods across um, that known area, the ancient Near Eastern gods, the Roman gods, the Greek gods, this was what worship and divine um, beings were like. So a lot of the creation narratives talk about creating the world so that they could feed the gods, the people were there just to be their servants and their slaves. The gods were kind of petty like human beings were, they had arguments with each other, they did random things, random acts of violence, and the purpose of a sacrifice was to keep these really petty gods happy. If you did it in the right kind of way, then they'd stop being quite so irritated and your life could go on and be much more peaceful. It sounds like a very chaotic way to see the cosmos, doesn't mm. it? Well, and I suppose, in a way, um, it it fits the way in which you see the world. If you look at the world, the world is quite chaotic. Um, and so actually to have a picture of the gods whom you worship being like that kind of fits in an, in an, in an odd kind of a way. Doesn't do it for yep. me, but it clearly <laughs> did it for them. The Greek gods were warriors. And so you read the Iliad, which is you know, the, the classic Greek text. And the Greek gods are very good warriors. And so there's a sense in which um, they led the way in, in military prowess, but one could, one could better describe that as the gods reflected the ideals of Greece, uh, the military Greece. But the curious thing about ancient Greek and Roman religion compared to the modern notion of religion is that ethics wasn't really connected to God. The gods weren't that interested in how you lived other than that you gave them due honor through offerings, through the various rituals, through marking the days that, that were set aside for that God. Um, but how I treated you was just not part of the mix. Um, the connection between ethics and um, belief in God is uh, a, a one given by Judaism and inherited by Christianity and um, via that given to the Western world. Our very notion of religion is different from how Greeks and Romans viewed it. The only model of leadership that existed was, you know, crush your enemies and uh, roll, roll forward. And Jesus, he changed that. He basically said, we're supposed to love our enemies. And that puts everybody, you know, it stops everyone because the last thing people normally would think of to do is to love their enemies. So you suddenly think, well, what does he mean by that? And what, does he do? what he's doing is he's making me understand that I'm no better than my enemy. I just maybe have been blessed to know something that they don't know, and so I've got to treat them the way I would want them to be treated if the shoe were on the other foot. And he's saying, you're all my children, and I want you to treat each other this way. So Paula, we have found humility is a virtue, which wasn't really the, the case in the time of Jesus. Oh, absolutely not. In the time of Jesus, um, humility was the opposite. It was a vice, really. It's that in order to be somebody important, you need to be appear in all ways to be important. Humility would have been just an awful idea for them. So it's, it's a real change in how leadership was framed up mm, within the community. Absolutely. And the reason why that is, is because it works. It's, it's the right thing that happens when you have um, any kind of grouping together. If people can act to each other in humility, then actually it completely changes um, the atmosphere, the feeling, the way in which they relate to each other. So Jesus comes into that culture. Um, how did he shift our thinking about leadership? Because it's quite crucial, wasn't it? Well, 
Jesus comes into an environment where you've got the greatest empire the world had ever known, an empire that eclipsed the Greek Empire. And no one thought anything could eclipse the Greek Empire, Alexander the Great and so on. But the, Ro the Roman um, uh, infrastructure um, brought such an amazing hold on the Mediterranean and beyond. So everyone knew who was in charge. And Jesus is born into this very um, powerful context. But he's part of a very different tradition. He doesn't come from the Greek and Roman tradition. He comes from the Jewish tradition, which had begun already in the later prophets of the Old Testament, begun to say really bizarre things like, God likes the poor. Uh, and, and even God likes the humble. But in those texts, the humble are really the humbled those who have been crushed by oppressors. But you've got this beginning motif of the God of the universe actually having quite a soft spot for those who are down low, who have been crushed low. So, so, so Jesus comes into this enormous empire from his own Jewish tradition, knowing that God loves the humbled. But the, the curious thing that Jesus adds to that Jewish tradition is the decision to be humble. Not simply to be humbled, by outside forces, but a decision to lower yourself uh, for the sake of another. And he said very humble oriented things like, you know, whoever wants to be um, first among you must be your slave. Um, he, he said, even I did not come to be served, but to serve. And so he said things that turned upside down what you'd normally expect of leadership. How did Jesus talk about humility? I mean, what did he either say or do that actually kind of put that on the agenda? Paul's talking about Jesus and talking about his greatness, but the way that he describes that is who, being in the very form of God, I, I had a Greek New Testament pre, uh, teacher when I was in college, and he talked about that passage. Um, Paul uses a little participle, being in the form of God, and you have to figure out how should we translate that participle. And sometimes it's translated as a concessive, although he was in the form of God. My old teacher, Dr. Hawthorne, said actually the best translation of it is, who precisely because he was in the form of God, made himself nothing, took the form of a servant. Because when Jesus became a servant, he wasn't disguising who God is. That's what the Greeks would have thought. That's what the Romans would have thought. When Zeus and Hermes come down, they disguise themselves as humble people. When Jesus came as a little baby, when he became a carpenter, when he died on a cross, he wasn't disguising who God is. He was revealing who God is. The historical moment that changed everything was not so much his teaching, but his crucifixion. Because in the crucifixion, power is given up in such a, an extraordinary way. The cross was viewed, crucifixion generally was viewed as the ultimate punishment in the Roman Empire, the lowest point in the world, you could say. And yet the Christians believe Jesus chose to go there. Not that he was humbled, not that he was crushed, but that he'd willingly given himself. And so they had, they had a choice. Does this mean Jesus wasn't as great as we thought, because there he is on a cross? Or does it mean we have to change what we think about greatness? It really does seem that the turning point, and when I say this, I just mean it historically, not theologically. The turning point in history, in terms of this motif of the humble leader, is the crucifixion of Jesus, where the Christians spotted that to be truly great means to lower yourself for the sake of another. It isn't to deny your own status. Jesus, of course, knew he had quite a heavy, large status, but he chose to orient it toward the good of others. And we can date this pretty precisely because um, you suddenly get, in the middle of the first century, shortly after Jesus' crucifixion, you, sh you get texts that use the word humility which had meant to be crushed or to be humbled by another, you start to see it used as a virtue, a positive virtue, to humble yourself for the sake of another, just as Jesus did. One of the things that Jesus constantly talked about was what it was to lead. And what he was trying to do was reset 
his followers' attitudes on leadership. He talked about it all the time, but he gave one object lesson that was really important. There was a Passover meal. It's a special Jewish celebration. They had everything they needed, all the food, etc. But they'd forgotten to get someone there to wash people's feet. Now, in a place where men wore sandals, it was hot and dusty, and you reclined at a table, washing people's feet was really important to make the meal bearable. So when there was no one to wash people's feet, Jesus grabbed the towel and put it around himself, got a bowl of water and washed his disciples' feet, his followers' feet. And then he said, if I as your leader washed your feet, you ought to wash other people's feet. In other words, if you're going to lead, be humble in leadership. Well, I think, I think what Jesus does is he washes his disciples' feet. I'm at one of these English boarding schools where um, I went when I was eight years old. I'm fine now, I've just about recovered <laughs> from the experience. My parents lived abroad, I get sent to this school. And um, uh, uh, you know, these schools are, are not about producing service. They're not about producing servants. They're about conditionally loving you. So uh, we'll love you if you succeed. And therefore, rather like the ancient Roman world, you favor those above you who can pull you up the ladder, but you push down on those below you. And suddenly I become a Christian. I realize I've got to serve the younger boys in the boarding house. Suddenly I become a Christian. I, I spend my gap year in the inner city of Liverpool. I, I don't do a gap year around the world. I go to Australia, which would have perhaps been what my brother did actually, went to Australia and New Zealand. No, I, I, I go to the inner city of Liverpool. I'm not trying to be pompous, but Jesus says you serve. So I become a youth worker in, in Liverpool in an urban priority area because that's what Christian faith says. Um, the Bishop of Liverpool, David Shepherd, who was an alumni of my school, came along. He said, if you're Christian, you'll come and spend your gap year in Liverpool because you should be serving. Well, well, that was... I mean, I think my family thought, what are, what's he doing, this boy? Well, it's because I'd come to faith. I was speaking to, to someone the other day, and uh, they've been working out in um, the most difficult areas in, in the world. And she said, uh, uh, this girl, um, Edwina Thompson, she said, why is it wherever I go, the most difficult places I go, I find Catholic nuns? You know, these women who've given their lives to serving in the most difficult places. And it's because the call of Christ is to serve. and. To, to, to serve those who, who have nothing. Now, the church may not be doing that, but that doesn't mean they're following their master. You know, if we're following him, that's what we should be doing. It's fascinating when you look at the modern missionary movement. It was really born out of uh, this a particular man who believed that this is what um, he ought to be doing. Uh, Hudson Taylor, you know, a lot of people have known what he's done in China. But it, it's fascinating when you see how he basically went to China, lived among the Chinese. It, it's just so reminiscent of what Jesus did, you know. He, he went there and unlike the missionaries of the past, he dressed like a Chinese. Um, it, of course, he learned the language and he lived among them, like them. And he learned the culture and he, he was culturally very Chinese. So I think just the, the humility, you know, um, that Hudson Taylor um, um, manifested or expressed, I think is, is a very clear example of what Jesus was talking about. And, and clearly Hudson Taylor saw Christ as the model, as the, the example of how he ought to have lived his life. And it's fascinating if you think about how just the results, even up to today, of what of that act of Hudson Taylor and the, the number of people who have come to know Jesus because of what he did and how he's lived his life. The problem is you become a Christian and those same self-centered um, desires are in place. Although fortunately I've got such a stupid name, Rico Tice, it's not a great name to try and make it. A lot of people think I'm called Tico Rice, which sounds like <laughs> number 42 at the takeaway. So, but I think there's that self sense of, of, of desiring self-honor and actually um, what the Spirit of Christ does is it means you become a servant. So, so it's that sense that success in life is in serving. And I think that was the great, the great um, challenge. But then what happens is you find that the way God's made the universe is counterintuitive. So as you give your life away in service, you find it. That's what's extraordinary, because you're aligning yourself with the laws of the universe. The cross is at the center of the universe. As you give yourself in service, suddenly you find joy.
if you if you know if you're utterly self-centered there's profound emptiness It's interesting really that we live in a culture where from a very early age on our children are encouraged to believe they can have it all because it's about them. You see it in the advertising industry, buy this product, you deserve it. Look after the most important person in the world, you. Do you know the amazing thing about that is that when voters see politicians behaving like that, in other words, living out the very value system that we tend to promote to our children as being the right one, they're repulsed by it. Mm. They actually understand at that point, now wait a minute, we actually think leadership should be about service. For you, how is Jesus the game changer? The most game changing thing in the, in the whole Jesus narrative is the thought that God Almighty, according to the New Testament, um, suffered the betrayal of friends, um, public injustice, brutal torture, and a final breath. If that's true, if that's God going through that, this does change everything because it means despite the things in the world I don't get, the, the pain and the evil that I just don't get, I can't say God doesn't know what that's like. I can't say God can't be trusted because there's this moment that changes forever my picture of God. He can't be the remote, aloof, power-hungry puppeteer. He is the one who would rather give himself through violence and injustice and, and the betrayal of those closest to him. He would rather go through that for me than to see me lost from him forever. I think that changes everything. There you have it, guys. So, I mean, the game that we're talking about in the Game Changer series is really about life, isn't it? It's about how Jesus has changed our life, has changed history. But if we only just see it as a, a nice little educational sort of intellectual experience, then we're kind of missing the real meat of this series, aren't we? If we sit there and go, yeah, that's cool that leaders should be humble. Of course they should, you know, we look for that in people and don't realise the implications that it has for our own lives, then we've kind of wasted our time. See, a lot of people will be sitting there going, well, I'm kind of glad I don't have a leadership position, that, you know, I'm not the boss of a firm or a, the pastor of the church or you know, whatever situation you think of when you hear the term leader without realising that those of us who are children of God, those of us who have the Spirit of God living in us, that are sons and daughters of God, that that gives us authority, that that gives us a position of leadership, whatever the situation is that we are in. And if we were to grasp that, can you imagine what that would look like? Kind of enjoyed sitting there while that was going on, thinking about that, how would this actually play out if we as a body of believers, if every Christian, if everyone that had the Holy Spirit of God living in them, put this into practice of others first, of taking that um, example of Jesus who being precisely because he was God, made himself a man. What would that look like when we go home and the dishes are due to be done? When there's an argument and we think that we are right, but we choose instead to take that position of humility, that we choose to take that position of, of being a slave, of not having any rights ourselves, how might that change the way we relate to our family, to those who are closest to us, to those who are at work? Can you picture that in your head? Can you imagine just what that would look like in your life? I mean, for me, it would... It would change the way people view Christianity. It takes away any grounds for people to have contempt or arguments, for there to be any anger or disputes when somebody comes, comes um, in a spirit of humility to serve. Can you imagine that? When I was preparing the final little bit, I thought, what is, what is the thing that would 
sum up what we're trying to talk about here, the, the big one take home, the, the big take home message for us. And I came up with this that the way to change the world like Jesus did is to be and to do as Jesus did. Giving our lives in humble service. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Jesus puts it like this. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much that you loved enough to send your son, knowing that he would experience that final breath. Thank you that you didn't just stand back from afar and say, these are the things you should do, but you came in person and you lived it out for us. And thank you, Lord, that you didn't just leave us as orphans after Jesus returned to you, but that you sent the Holy Spirit to be our helper, to be living in us so that we too could be children of God. Father, help us to live that out this week, this life that we would be shining examples of what it is to be a servant of Christ. Lord, conform us ever more into your image. For your name's sake, for your glory's sake, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, bless you. Have a great week. And um, yeah, have a think about that. Dwell on that. Ruminate on that as you make your lunch. What would it look like for me to be more like Jesus? Thank you. Thank you.